All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January 19th, 2022 meeting of the Armand School Committee. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so begin with introductions down here to my right, please. Brian Belknap, Ward 4. <laughs> Clarissa Perez Arbandari's Ward 1. Pam Hart, Ward 2. Karen Matthew, Ward 3. Connie Brown, Superintendent. Pat Gaudier, at large. Pamela Albert, at large. Jason Lebec, Mayor. Abigail Fauche, Student Representative. Gabriel Desperdell, Student Representative. Mark Conrad, Business Manager. Sue Doris, Assistant Superintendent. All right, thank you, everyone. Before I ask for an approval um, for tonight's consent agenda, I need to make an adjustment to the minutes for January 4th. I need to adjust them to say that we did not leave at 7.30 on January 4th through the retreat. Let the record show that we left at 9.45, please. So with that correction to the minutes, can I have an approval of tonight's agenda, which includes the minutes of January 5th and January 4th, please. So moved. Thank you, Brian. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Pam. All those in favor? Motion passes, thank you. Let's open it up to public participation, please. Anyone from the public would like to come and join us this evening? Please. I think the podium may be a better spot for you. Yeah, Welcome, I'm take sir. The podium. Is the mic on at the microphone? I oh, it's it on. Thank you. Welcome, I checked sir. It, I checked it earlier. Okay, great. Can you please state your name and um, your affiliation with the Auburn School to public, for <coughs> public record, please? My name is Mo Galano. I live in Auburn. Thank you. Do I need a, is that all you need? Nope, that's perfectly great. How can we help you, sir? Okay, uh, before, we, before I start speaking, a uh, few things on your, I pulled this up from your rules of order mm -hmm. that you have, and it says uh, that you follow Robert's rules of order. Is that correct? It's printed right here. So I'd like to read two things from Robert's rules of order mm -hmm. on, 4.29, it states, speeches shall be no longer than 10 minutes. I'm gonna to go to rule 43.8. Maximum amount of time should be for speeches is 10 minutes. So now, I am gonna to go to your policies which I printed from, and on line B, it says, the chair may limit the amount of time for comments on a particular topic. <clears throat> Citizens are asked to be succinct and to speak for less than three minutes. Does anybody know the difference between a requirement and asking someone? This says you are asking for three minutes. Request denied. I won't take 10 minutes, but I need to make that point. So please do not shut me off after three minutes. <coughs> I've done a little research on different school districts in terms of busing. So these are the numbers I've found in the past week. SED 52, which is Turner, 20 bus runs, they have 20 drivers. They are in need of substitutes, they don't have any, but they are fully staffed on their runs. Brunswick School Department, 19 bus runs, 19 drivers, fully staffed. They are in looking for subs. Winthrop, seven runs, Seven drivers, 100%. So those three of 100%. Lisbon, 13 runs, 10 drivers. They are at 77%. Lewiston, 55 runs, 38 drivers. They are at 69%. Poland, 24 runs, 15 drivers. They are at 62%. Auburn, 23 runs, 12 drivers, 52%. Now, I'm accounting for the elimination of two runs that have happened in the last two weeks. If it would have been 25 
runs like it was two weeks ago, you'd be looking at 48%. We are at the bottom of the list. That's pretty bad. We're spending $120 million on a new high school. In two years, the kids going to school will probably have to walk because you won't have any bus drivers. At the last meeting, you said, well, we're in contract with the union. I firmly believe that even with a contract with the union, it's not going to help you. So there is a problem. Now, they credit Albert Einstein with the saying, with the definition of insanity. And what that says is, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. What are we doing different? What are we going to do different? to change what's going on. Anybody have any ideas? I learned something at a meeting many years ago. They said, if I came with a problem, to present a solution. So why don't you contact all the lost drivers in the last two years? Call them up, have a subcommittee, two or three people, four people. Call the drivers and say, why did you leave? Was it wages? Was it benefit? Was it personnel? Find out. If you don't know what the problem is, how are you going to fix it? And I'm looking to you folks to fix it. $120 million for a school. Please do something. You, we just can't keep going like this. It's impossible. It's not feasible. So thank you for coming this evening. Um, it's, and I've just received clarification that our policy states that we lean on Robert's rules, but for public participation, our policy trumps Robert's rules. So our policy states no more than three minutes. You've spoken on the topic, and I have to ask you to rely on the elected officials who are up here. We know there is an issue. And unfortunately, I can't discuss what goes okay. on in public with some of the issues that we are working that. through. But we are well aware of this issue. And we are working tirelessly to support bus drivers and, and get our kids Show to me where it says you can limit me to three minutes. Show me. In the policy book. It is, it is three minutes, sir. It is completely vetted through legal, law. No, they're all online. They're, They're all, all online, online and you know I, how to access I have them. looked online more than once. So, and the only line I see is citizens are asked to speak for less than three minutes. Asked. That's the only thing I, I find on here. You are asked, and if you, uh, you are asked to speak for no more than three minutes. You can ask. That's not a requirement. There's a difference. So it, it's, uh, it's ironic your name is Karen also. Oh, sir, thank you very much for, pu for public okay. participation this evening. Please turn his mic off until he leaves. Yeah. I'll be back. Thank you, sir. I'll see you soon. <laughs> yes. All right, seeing none, public participation is closed. I don't believe our presentation this evening, but we do have uh, our school committee reps would like to do their presentations. So tonight I just wanted to present on the highlights from the past semester just because we're entering a new one shortly and I did want to recognize, oh, I did want to recognize that the elementary schools go by trimesters and I was not informed of that. So I will also be presenting on them. 
So at East Auburn, students have been working on STEM projects, and these STEM projects have included coding with robots, which has been interesting for the kids. Students have also enjoyed their new playground equipment, and this was purchased by the East Auburn PTO. At Fairview, students have enjoyed their new literacy and math programs and continue to work hard through their units, and their hard work is often displayed around the halls of Fairview. Fairview has been working hard to earn blue tickets and fill their, or, and they filled their tube this year to have a school-wide camping day, which is seen in the middle picture. And students earn blue tickets for being safe, respectful, and responsible. Students just filled their ticket tube again and will be having another celebration, which will most likely be presented on at a future meeting. <laughs> Um, the Fairview community was also able to provide 15 families with food this past Thanksgiving. At Park Avenue, students have been learning about nutritious snacks with Miss Emily from Healthy Androscoggin. Students have received their Panther Goals with Buddy classes doing loads of activities. The Park Ave Garden provided their food pantry with lots of vegetables and they growed and collected about 30 pounds of carrots from their garden this year. And students also visited their school orchard and were able to learn about the trees with their class, as well as pick apples and pears as an added treat. Sixth grade students recently went caroling around the school at Sherwood Heights. Students were also able to make gingerbread houses for the first time in two years due to COVID. Sherwood hosted a therapy dog and fourth graders loved the experience. Second graders were able to have a Zoom field trip with Acadia National Park due to COVID restrictions. And for the Libra cluster, which is first grade, kindergarten, and pre-K, students worked on their inquiry projects in which they voted for a class pet and wrote books on what their fish needs. And finally, Auburn Middle School. The Drama Club put on shows for the Canterbury Tales in December, and they performed shows for the student body along with four shows for the Auburn community. It has been reported that the winter sports team have proven to represent the AMS community extremely well, being respectful to all. And students as well as staff have enjoyed the new math and literacy programs that they've been using this year. And that is all I have for tonight. At the next meeting, I will be presenting on Washburn, Walton, Edward Little, and Franklin Merrill High School. Great, thank you, Abby. Thanks. All set, Kay? Uh, if you don't mind, I need to look up my presentation. I emailed it to them, but I forgot to tell them about it, so. So this is an extension of my presentation two meetings ago. Uh, Mrs. Gagne personally contacted me to tell everyone on the school board about this event. Uh, my presentation will be talking about the event, Haircuts for Hope, hosted by um, All About You Salon, owned by Mrs. D. Chapman. Haircuts for Hope is hosted about a week before Christmas. D. Chapman explained to me the process in which she goes through to plan this event. She asked local businesses to provide supplies for a Christmas party she hosts in her salon while the children get their haircuts. Each child gets something different each year. This year it was sleeping bag and some hygienic supplies, like hairbrush that she personally provides for the children. She provides each child with one voucher a little before holiday break to go and redeem their haircut, and she usually gives around 25 to 30 vouchers each year. Up next is a video she wanted me to share with the board. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas.
Gabe, did you say how many years she's put this on? Oh, I was just about to, she, oh, where is it? <coughs> she did explain how many years it was and she wanted me to also give you some detail on what she does, how she does it, and how it helps. Uh, um, Dee started this event some years ago and originally went to local homeless shelters and gave our homeless haircuts for free during this holiday season. But starting 11 years ago, she started to host Haircuts for Hope in the Auburn School District. I asked her what guided her to host these events for the Auburn School District, and she stated, quote, My kids are blessed and fortunate, so it's Christmas to, Christmas to me. And giving back is what fills my heart and what makes me feel good, especially when you've been blessed. In the past year, she's hosted this event for Washburn, Walton, Sherwood, AMS, and Edward Little. As stated before, she contacts local providers to provide her with supplies for her Christmas party. She hosts at the event. A local market provides snacks and pizza, and a local insurance company provides her with different useful items such as strap bags for children. All of the guests come straight from the community or her from, from her directly, and they get backpacks with necessities every year. <coughs> this photo is from last year, and uh, every year her operation keeps growing with more community input and more partici participation, as she states. She said that she got a lot more donations and input from the community this year than she did last year, um, especially with the tough times of COVID and all. Dee stated when she hosts these events, quote, it's a Christmas miracle when it happens. And when she's planning these events, it's just happening. It's not stressful. And it's an amazing experience for her. Uh, Mr. Davis is seen in this picture. Uh, I believe two years ago or so, they hosted Walton. An example of some winter essentials she gives to each child, I believe, uh, I believe last year she stated that she was giving out winter boots to each child as well. Along with her and her colleagues hope, she wants to thank the school guidance counselors that work with her and the bus drivers who volunteer their time to provide transportation to these children, especially on such short notice, since she plans this only a week before winter break. This isn't any months in advance. Uh, and finally, not only is All About You Salon providing these children with the Christmas, but all local companies in the Twin Cities and individuals volunteer their supplies and their time to give these children a holiday season they won't forget. Personally, Dee Chapman truly embodies the holiday spirit by hosting these events each year to provide children with a stylish haircut and their everyday essentials. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Thank you to Dee Chapman for all and all your um, else for helping you out with that. Thank you. All right, Superintendent's Report, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much, Chairperson Matthew. There are a couple of memos in my report that I'd like to go over with you. Uh, the first is to let you know that the Maine CDC and DOE have revised guidelines regarding the Omicron surge, and it speaks to contact tracing. I sent out a note to families today. I, I waited because I thought the department was going to send out some updated guidance, and they did, and that came out late yesterday, early this morning. So that has gone out to families that talks about the notification procedures. We will continue to notify families when we have a positive case in the schools, but we're not going to do contact tracing any longer. Um, so Dr. Brown, how will you, can I ask a quick question, how will you notify families? I'm kind of going back to like the lice letter. There's a lice sure. in the classroom. So Brown. I'm going to ask Dr. Doris because you're the author of that particular yes. letter. So we are going to notify families if there's a positive case in a classroom, at the classroom level. Okay, so sort of like a, and when I say lice letter, there's sort of like this generic letter that goes off that in yes. your classroom, this has been detected yes. and so be aware. Yep, they'll, they'll receive a notification and they'll also receive a more detailed letter that explains this, you know, what to look for and what okay. to do if their child develops symptoms. Okay, all right, and that's only for the for their home. Uh, it's so a classroom exposure. Classroom. Yeah. So now I'm at the high school and I'm mm -hmm. in many classrooms. Yep. So all. all so if of I'm those. sitting in my English class and this person is in my English class with me, but not in my math class, I'll get notification. Yes. Okay. Can I Okay. Can I just ask one clarifying question? How are those notifications being sent out? Are they emails, phone calls? 
they're going to be sent out through our school messenger system. So it may be a robocall. It also may be coming as an email or a text with an attachment. And the attachment will be the letter with more information. OK. Thank you. Pam? So because we're, we're fully masking, these children don't have to be home. They can just, they just have to continue wearing masks, continue um, coming to school, and just watch out for symptoms. Is that what we're, we're yes, doing? Yes, I think, I think the biggest thing that we need to do is have our families monitor their children for symptoms. And if a child develops symptoms, then they should stay home, mm -hmm. and they should potentially test, and parents should contact their child's PCP. Thank you. Well, I think, Sue, that's a good segue into our participation in pool testing from the beginning of school, which is the 4th through the 14th. How many positive cases and total number of positive cases? Okay, so with pool testing, the week of January 3rd, which was the first week we came back, for participants, for students, we had 942 participants and uh, 141 staff participating. And that week, we identified eight positive cases. Also, I just want to mention to you that a particular week was a short week. And then the following week, the week of the 10th, um, we had 961 students participating. So that was a little bit more we had added there. And then for staff, we had 139. And that week, we identified 23 positive cases. And that was a tricky week. We had a snow day the previous Friday. And so we also, that week, because we start on Tuesday, we did our pool testing, but the results didn't come back in a timely way. So as we ended the week on a snow day, some of those cases rolled into the next week. Thanks, Sue. And so our total number of positive cases identified, I think that you yes. have answered. Yeah. Um, How about student absenteeism? Yeah, so let me go back to the positive cases because I just want to also report out on the cases that came into us, not just from pool testing, but on the week of the 3rd, we had six cases. The week of the 10th, we had 76 total cases. So that's how that played out. You said 76? 76, <coughs> so yes. So that's 76 additional that came into you, or that includes pool testing? That's including the pool okay. testing, yeah. Uh, then to go to the student absenteeism, I'm going to give you the average from January 4th through January 14th for the district. For our student absenteeism rate, it was 15.45%. And for our staff, it was 8.81%. And if you take total staff and students together, it was 14.62%. How does that run compared to you know, a typical week? Well, pre-COVID, this is a little higher than it well, no. <laughs> would normally be, yeah, but uh, <laughs> it was a little bit. It was a little bit higher. Okay, so say you know our absenteeism rates were up. In December. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In comparison to previous months and previous weeks. Okay, so we ticked up a little bit. Yeah, we today. ticked up a little bit. We okay. are monitoring our absences, and we are counting up the number of health-related absences. We actually just added a field in power school mm -hmm. so that we could monitor this because we, for the CDC and the DOE, we are watching to see if we reach 15% uh, for absences related to illnesses. OK. Can I ask a just a sec. Yeah. Oh, Pam, did you have? So in terms of reporting to DOE, for the 15% absenteeism, mm -hmm. um, is that by building or is that overall? By that's district? by building. That's by building. Yeah. So during, so in the past two weeks, has there been any building that's been over 15% that had to report? Not for illness-related absences. Okay. So we you're have we now. have had some high absenteeism yeah. in a couple of our buildings, but not for the health-related. We haven't gotten up to 15% for the health-related. Okay reasons. And in terms of reporting for the health related reasons, we're including the at home positives that are reported to us. Yes, we report yep. positive cases and we report when students are in isolation. Okay. We don't report quarantine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Clarissa? Well, that sort of answers my question, but I was wondering if the reporting of at home testing is fully just at 
at the initiative or voluntary preparator if there's any outreach for voluntary order absence? Yeah, whenever a student is absent, a phone call is made home and we determine the reason for the absence and then we note whether or not it's related to illness or something else. Any other questions? Yeah. Do we have any data on hospitalizations and fatalities among student population and employees? No, I would have to research that. If we could? Yes. All right, any other questions, Pat? <coughs> for the, <coughs> for the uh, benefit of people that are listening, what happens when that 15% threshold when that when we reach that 15% what we do is submit a report through the NEO system and that will trigger a CDC investigation it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're reaching an outbreak status for COVID but it will trigger an investigation and what happens then is we go further into looking at the reasons for the illness you know what are the different symptoms and how many of those might be related to COVID or COVID-like symptoms? How many positive cases do we have uh, of COVID? How many students do we have home you know, with COVID in isolation? And then those numbers determine whether or not we would be in an outbreak. And my understanding of this is that if we reach the 15% and then we go further and break that down, we would have to have the majority of those absences due to illness be COVID related and that would put us in outbreak status. And if that happens, what's going to happen? Well, if that happens, that would be a conversation we would have with the CDC and the DOE and we would have a meeting and talk about, you know, what's happening in the school and other factors as well, staff as well, staff and students. But I'm just going to follow up. Last year, we, we kept schools open even in outbreak status. It doesn't necessarily yes. mean we are shutting down or going remote or That's anything correct. like that. OK. That's Andrew, correct. Question? Um, I do. I am curious about the test to stay and if it's been initiated mm -hmm. and how that's working out. Because I know that some, you know, we're in flu season. There are colds. Some parents still want to send their kids to school, and they do. Um, and if they, we have started doing the test to stay. We, we actually have done some test to stay um, tests uh, this week. And so it's really a, a great thing to have as a tool because if a student comes to school with symptoms and you know we're wondering should they stay or not and the parent is open to having a test and, and allows us permission to do that, we can tell whether or not the child is positive or negative for COVID. I, I, I agree, and I think that it's a, um, it's a great kind of second step so that we, can't, we can um, clarify and make sure that the, kid, the children are, are, aren't sick. So thank you. I, I like that. Anyone, any other questions, comments? I guess my only, other, my only other question would be, and I don't know if you would have this handy or not, but would be, was there at any point, I think you mentioned absenteeism for staff, the highest was like 8% or something. Mm -hmm. That was um, the average The rate. average. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm just curious if there was any day over the last couple of weeks in any one building where the staff absenteeism was high that it was a struggle in terms of covering classrooms. We've been very lucky uh, the last couple weeks coming back, we've been able to cover classrooms yeah. and it, we've been able to do it. I feel that Auburn is very fortunate right now because we look around and we're seeing that it's, it's very tough in other places. But so far, we've been able to cover. Great. Great. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just one more item under my report, and that is a follow-up to some questions asked at the State of the Schools. These are data pertaining to staff mobility rates and the definition of poverty from the Anna E. Casey Foundation. I'd be happy to answer any questions about that. Any questions, Dr. Brown? It's a link in the All right, seeing none. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no school committee chairperson's report tonight. Uh, city council update, Mr. Mayor. Oh yeah, it'll take me about 15 minutes on this one. Wait, 10 minutes is my cap. Uh, <laughs> Three. 
Three, so I'll make it quick. Uh, two really big things um, that I want to make announcements on here. Last night at the city council meeting, and I have to thank administrators for kind of being the, uh, I would say that the spark for this idea, especially talking about mobility and talking about absenteeism, I rolled out a proposal using our federal ARPA funds to incentivize building of new homeowner duplexes and triplexes. So it's $10,000 per unit built to someone who builds new construction, a two unit or a three unit building here in Auburn. Hopefully this will help with mobility issues, generational poverty, which is obviously our big goal, as well as um, uh, just really higher test scores in general. So hopefully we can all talk about this amongst our communities uh, when this is rolled out and finally approved, hopefully February 7th. The second one, and you may have heard of this already, but this is also coming from some of the conversations we've had as a body about uh, lack of teachers, ed techs, employees in general, bus drivers especially, as well as on the city side, police, fire, and the whole plethora of uh, unfilled spots out there. We are now offering, or I proposed last night, it will be debated and hopefully passed, a $20,000 new construction building grant or forgivable loan for any municipal and school employee who builds a new home here in Auburn. You can couple that with a duplex or triplex and some of the incentives there as well. Uh, the idea here is to get new employees here in Auburn. So let's look at teachers. You get a new teacher that graduates from University of Maine, she wants to be a teacher, she wants to move to Auburn, she can build a new home, a duplex, a triplex. As long as she works in the city for five years, she, that's a grant, it's completely forgivable. Now, if they're an existing teacher, um, and they're coming up to their midway career mark. Well, if they want to ups, up, uh, upsize their home or maybe downsize their home, they're still they're working currently for Auburn. They could actually use this grant and build a new dwelling. Great. They could actually add an accessory dwelling unit to their property, so they can have a form of rental income. Maybe they can even rent it to a new teacher as they're getting acclimatized to Auburn. So these are two distinctively different, though complementary programs designed to do multiple things overarching and generational poverty, build pride in community, get our employees in our neighborhoods, in our communities, so they can enrich them and strengthen the fabric of our communities. And I know for a fact, kids used to love going to teachers' homes on Halloween because A, they gave out the biggest candy bars, <laughs> but B, they got giggly because it's their teachers living in the neighborhood and they're knocking on their door. So those things should happen and we can continue to promote that. We'll need all of your input on this from administration to faculty. How do we make it better? Is it gonna be impactful? Is this gonna be enough to be different within the marketplace when we're all competing for the same amount of employees and the same very shallow pool at this point? So those are two, um, two large announcements from the city council. Um, that's it, and I welcome your feedback. So this was just, just presented last night? Last night. Okay, so, so fresh information for them last night. Fresh information, we're writing up all the rulemaking on it right now. Devil's obviously in the details, but we're gonna keep this pretty broad because the goal has to be achieved. We don't want this to be a, uh, a program that looks great on paper but can't be utilized. We applied $1 million, or at least I proposed $1 million in ARPA funds to fund both these programs at a half a million dollars each. Roughly, that's 100 new housing units at a minimum in the city of Auburn. That also helps in expand the tax base of the city as well. So that's gonna produce even additional property tax dollars that can obviously fully fund education, help with our police budgets, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of a, a revolving, if you would, a sustainability and resilient tool. Okay, any questions for Jason on this? Yeah. Um, does that also include already standing homes like in the downtown, as far as like a grant to help maybe beautify the, the buildings that we already have, or is it just brand new homes? Well, that's a great question. No, it doesn't. But we have, and what very few people realize, an amazingly deep toolbox of financial incentives to do just that already in place. $3.6 million in a federal grant for lead rehabilitation and remediation, uh, millions of dollars every year in federal home funds, community development block grants. All these are available to any homeowner or property owner in the city of Auburn. Obviously, there's some guidelines. We're looking at that right now. People can use it. Very few people do. Frankly, we have a hard time giving the money away for free. If we have any holes, we will probably fill those holes in with some ARPA money if they become apparent. Okay, so that, that exists already. Okay, great. And, and does, do the homes have to be in a certain section nope. of the town and city? 
Now, ideally, what we'd like to do is see infill because acquisition costs of land, because we have an, a, a serious problem of artificial scarcity within the city. Um, land is bottled up in uh, zones in which can't, no construction currently is not being allowed, but hopefully that'll be remedied. But yes, infill is obviously a priority, but especially with a $20,000 new construction grant for city employees, go and build a home. Live happily ever after. Work it on. Okay. Any other questions for Jason? Beth? Is there a cap? I mean, at some point, I mean, the more applications can be given. Is that part of what you're going Listen, to I tell you what, if we have more applications, the money will find more money. Uh, right now, we <laughs> put a million dollars to seed it. Um, and if it's a successful program, this is something that has a positive return on investment within five years of implementation, you will we'll absolutely seed it. And that's just the tangible, the tangible asset. The intangible is we're not talking about a lack of teachers in a classroom. We're not talking about cutting down a police beat because we don't have any uh, police officers between 10 a.m. and 7 a.m. on Saturday night. Those are the things you really can't put a price tag on. So yes, it does pay for itself quickly, um, but also it's the intrinsic value is huge. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Abigail. Um, so I have a question. So you said about roughly 100 houses would be proposed for Auburn. Is this already on the existing land that we have public, or is this on the proposed land that you would lo look forward into? It's a mix of everything. Okay. It's a mix of everything. If you look at some of our new zoning that's going to go through, it's going to loosen up the restrictions in our in-town lots. So a lot of lots you can't build on today, you will be able to, okay. hopefully, in the next several months. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Jason? All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moving on, committee reports. If you notice, they're a little bit, um, they're arranged a little differently so that standing committees will all, will be on here. If a standing committee met, which we have finance policy, uh, curriculum are on there. If that, if that standing committee met, you will notice meeting notes underneath it, which you can, uh, which you can access there. So the finance uh, subcommittee met uh, out of the uh, first meeting, myself, uh, Jason and Brian attended uh, and uh, report out on that basically that you know it's a it's a great opportunity for us to sort of Mark um, introduced us to sort of how the lay of the land and how the spreadsheets work how different policy uh, finances work going through that so anything to report other than <coughs> Jason or Brian have sort of just going back through. I think everything is there in the minutes that we discussed. Look, I'll just say from looking at financial data for years now at the municipal level, we're rock solid type. Everything is great. Uh, it's very transparent. It's all there. Um, looking forward to getting into it and working more with Mark and the rest of the staff on that too. So not looking forward to signing stacks of warrants every month though. Warrants well, are, that's a, that's a yes. Problem. I was gonna say those are free. I've done my Maybe job. I don't it, think yeah. you've done I your job. Mine, yeah. uh, Jason is also chairing that finance subcommittee as well. So you will be, Jason, when finance subcommittees come up, if there's anything you want to report, if there's anything to report that will fall under your, um, under your lane to do so. All right, policy subcommittee curriculum have not met. Uh, and the EL building committee subcommittee met via Zoom last Tuesday evening. I think uh, you have a handout there, short and sweet. We are on time, on budget but need to be uh, mindful of the fact that when the old Edward Little High School comes down, that what has been budgeted uh, may not be enough. So there are more, and I'm gonna get this wrong, PCBs, PCBs, uh, which are environmentally uh, not good, and that are in the building that will probably need, there are more than what was originally counted for and budgeted for. So we'll have to be mindful of that when it comes up. I think the, bid for that goes out soon. What is it, March? Correct, March? I, yeah, we talked about March with bid results coming back by May. Okay, March and then results in May. So stay tuned for that one. But other than that, on time and on budget, if you've not seen uh, or taken a drive by, it's coming, it, it's being built, it's amazing. All right, nothing with old, oh, any questions on any of those committees? Yes. I was just wondering if you wanted to put like a schedule yep. Can you pull your mic down so that your question can be heard? Uh, I'm sorry. I was wondering if um, we're going to schedule a DEI committee meeting. Is it a, it's a standing committee or is it not a standing committee? It is. That is not a standing committee. Um, so that would be something that folks that are on that committee would coordinate. Okay. 
All right, nothing under old business or new business. We have upcoming meetings. Uh, they are all listed here. So in addition to listing regular school committee meetings, we are also listing policy subcommittee meetings. And they are, do they try to follow a pattern? Um, so like either the last Tuesday of the month or the first Tuesday of the month, they try to follow a pattern uh, so that you can just sort of um, have your have your schedule coordinated. Uh, for example, curriculum committee uh, has typically met five o'clock right before a school committee meeting, the first school committee meeting of the month. So if you're wondering when some of these committee meetings are coming up, they're now listed on your agenda for you. <coughs> All right, future agenda items or requests for information. We have a request for motion. Yeah. Um, I, I'm still th I'm thinking about um, the gentleman who spoke earlier mm -hmm. and I, I think that parents also have concerns about the bus situation and so I know that there are conversations that are not public but I think there's probably some information that can be shared with the public at least about why we're having this shortage and what kinds of things are being done. Pam? Could I add to that as well? Um, he did mention, you know, asking past employees why they left. Do we do an exit interview when people have left? And um, if so, that would be beneficial to find out, you know, any reasons why. Not personal reasons, yeah. but okay. um, it'd be interesting to find out. Okay. We've done that. All right, any other? All right, seeing none, we have some executive sessions uh, this evening. So we need a motion to enter into Executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA uh, 4056A for the purpose of the evaluation of the superintendent and <coughs> pursuant to 1 MRSA 405D for the purpose of negotiations. So Do move. I have a motion? So move. Thank you, Brian. Second. Second. Thank you, Pam. All those in favor of entering executive session? Motion passes. We are now in executive session. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Um, I think we can stay. Here, we'll have to close everything up.